It's been said you should never ascribe to malice what can be adequately explained by incompetence. I would say you should never rule out malice just because you've established incompetence. And you should never rule out incompetence just because you've established malice. It's always possible somebody like Kyle Adams, who for no valid reason at all calls himself a professor, is both incompetent and malicious, or at the very least, moronic and dishonest. This, apparently, comes from his open quote, debate board, close quote, also known as his collection of uh, misrepresented evidence and dishonest counter-arguments. It is said, apparently, by someone, somewhere, at some point, in some document, which ain't cited, the diameter of the moon is about 2,160 miles. Like 99% of the rest of the world has been moved on to you know, scientific units, but no, he's stuck on miles. And that of the Earth, about 8,000. Why don't you try looking up the actual figures, you know? It is also stated, actually 8,000, let's just check. 8,000 miles times 63,360 inches per mile times 25.4 millimeters per inch divided by 1 million millimeters per kilometer is 12,874.752 kilometers. Divided by 2 is 6437.376. Bit of an overestimate. 6371 would be a better figure to give. Or in this case, 6378 would be a better figure to give. 6437. Slightly wrong. Apparently the guy can't do remembering more than the first significant digit. Although he did get 2160 rather than just 2000 for the moon. Huh. It is also stated, again, by someone, somewhere, allegedly, according to this guy, no citation provided, that the moon's motion around the Earth works out at about... Works out at about? How about that the Earth moon is going at, or travels at, about 37 miles per minute? I did check this one. You can check this one yourselves if you want to. You can go 37 times 63360 times 25.4... 37 miles is 59,545,728 millimetres per minute. Per minute. Miles per minute. What the what kind of unit is that? If we divide by 60, we get millimetres per second. And divide by 1,000, we get 992.43 metres per second, which is actually not a bad shot at the figure. It's not far off. While its journey round the s sorry, while in its journey around the sun, the Earth you know, most people put a capital E on that. Travels along at about one thousand and eighty miles per minute. Which is almost completely irrelevant. The relevance is there, but it is absolutely tiny and it's not in Kyle's favour. Now, supposing the shadow cast by the Earth on the Moon is equal to half its the Earth's diameter. Just, just supposing that. Just out of nowhere. Not even it is said that that is the case. Just, just supposing. Just, just um, suppose the shadow cast by the Earth on the Moon is equal to half the Earth's diameter. Let us have a game of dominoes. 4,000 miles is an outside estimate. It's not an outside estimate, you blithering idiot. If the diameter of the Earth is 8,000 miles, then 4,000 miles is half that diameter. Equal to half of 8,000 miles is 4,000 miles. That's not an outside estimate for a number equal to half of 4,000 miles. It is half of 4,000 miles. As the shadow would tend to converge. And here's somebody, anyone who 
actually knows anything about shadows is probably noticed the problem with his statement. He said shadow. He didn't specify umbra or penumbra. Converge means he's talking about the umbra, the conical volume in space on the outside of the Earth's orbit where no part of the sun is directly visible tapers to a point. The space beyond the Earth where some of the sun is blocked from direct view by the Earth gets wider with distance. That's the penumbra. He's talking about the umbra, which converges. This is important. And if these figures given by astronomers of the Earth's and Moon's motion are correct, astronomers of the Earth's and Moon motion, what the fuck, Kyle? Does he mean if these figures of the Earth's and Moon's motion given by astronomers are correct? Because that would be English. Readers will see it is impossible for an eclipse to last in the Moon for more than seven minutes. For an eclipse to last in the Moon. English, motherfucker! Do you speak it? Seven minutes. He, d he doesn't say how, he just says, readers will see. Adopt the pose of the downward dog, focus your mind onto the lotus flower, and you will see that it is impossible for an eclipse to last in the moon for more than seven minutes. What do you mean, Flash Gordon approaching? Although eclipses have been known to last for over four hours, so that this shows, that's almost English, the eclipse cannot possibly be caused by the shadow of the Earth's rotation. That's really not English. The shadow of the Earth's rotation? D do you need some brackets, Kyle? Do you need to put brackets around groups of words to clarify what you're trying to convey here? Does he mean the rotation of the Earth's shadow? Does Kyle, is Kyle trying to say that the moon just sits there in space within the gravitational wells of the sun and Venus and Saturn and the Earth and Mars and everything else around it? Jupiter, you know, uh, Ceres, Titan, Triton, Io, Callisto, uh, Europa, Ganymede, Damia and, f sorry, Deimos and Phobos. And everything else out there, and just, just sit still. And the Earth goes hurtling past it at 1,080 miles per minute, and the Earth's shadow goes beep across the moon. Is that what he's trying to imply? Is that how he think he wants to convey the idea that actual science says lunar eclipses happen? How about no? course, I can go on better than that. Supposing that the shadow cast by the Earth and the Moon is equal to half its bracket, the Earth's bracket diameter. Why would I suppose that when I can calculate it? I can get figures from NASA and do the actual calculation. There are some figures from NASA there. Based on them, the north, south, and east, west values are going to be very slightly different because north, south is based on the Earth's polar radius. East, west is based on, on the Earth's equatorial radius. Apart from that, they're the same calculation. The minimum possible width of the Earth's shadow at the distance to the Moon. Bear in mind we're talking about the umbra here. He did say converge, so we know we're talking about the umbra. That minimum possible umbra width is when going to be when the Moon is farthest from the Earth, obviously, as it's tapering to a point. And the faster that shadow tapers to a point, the narrower it'll be, at meaning the blunt of the shadow is, the narrower it'll be at any given distance from the Earth. So however far out the moon is, the closer the Earth is to the sun, the more that shadow will be tapered, and the narrower the umbra will be. So we go for the minimum distance from the sun, that 147 gigameters, or million kilometers, or thousand megameters, if you're into that, and the maximum distance Earth to moon. That gives us the the upper of each pair of lines. Earth radius, well, it's twice, because obviously if we're calculating based on radius and we actually want diameter, we have to double it eventually. 
how far from the equatorial plane the, the Earth's pole is, minus, and then that complicated thing, that is ratio of Earth-Moon distance to Earth-Sun distance, multiplied by how far south light from the northernmost visible part of the Sun has to go to skim the North Pole, or northernmost sunlit part of the Earth, depending on time of year. It's going to have to come down at some angle whose tangent is that distance south divided by the distance from the Sun to the Earth, and how far south it goes on the way from the Earth to the Moon is the tangent of that angle multiplied by the Earth-Moon distance. So we can forget all about tangents and arctangents and just multiply the Earth Earth-Moon distance uh, by how far south it's come and divide by the Earth-Sun distance. How, which way, way around do you want to put those terms? That gives us a figure of 8,913 kilometers. If you go for maximum value, the only difference is you want the Earth as far from the Sun as possible and the Moon as close to the Earth as possible, so you go for the you go for a sore throat, is what you go for. You go for the aphelion and the perigee, which is why you get 3633 instead of 4055 and 1521 instead of 1471. You get 9,420 kilometers. East-west, same thing, but you're using equatorial radius, not polar, so you get 8,956 kilometers or 9,463 kilometers. Somewhere in the range, 8,900 to 9,500 kilometers. He said 4,000 miles was an outside estimate for half of 8,000 miles. Don't forget that part. But 4,000 miles is only 6,437 kilometers. Which is... Um, it's, that's a figure with a quality that's known in science as being wrong. Right. Moon's minimum orbital velocity, 970 meters per second, conveniently the same as the muzzle velocity of an L86. Coincidentally, not conveniently, nothing convenient about it, it's just, just a coincidence. That is relative to the Earth. Right, the Earth and the Moon are going together, well, they're both going around their shared barrier center, and their shared barycenter is going around the Earth, Moon, Sun, shared barycenter. But you can think of this as the Earth and Moon going around the Sun because they are so tiny compared to the Sun. The Earth, Moon, Sun, shared barycenter is really, really close to the center of the Sun. And if you have your frame of reference locked to the center of the Earth and aligned to distant stars, the moon's velocity in that frame of reference, which is traveling with them around the sun, is 970 meters per second. Given a moon radius, straight from NASA, of 1,737 kilometers, double that for the diameter, subtra subtract it from the width of the shadow, east-west, because the moon is actually going west to east, and that will tell you how far the moon goes from just being fully inside the umbra as it enters to just just being still being fully inside the umbra just before it exits. Divide that by how fast it's going, 907 meters per second, you get 6,174 seconds. Now, technically, it would go through a little bit faster than that because I've done that with the minimum orbital velocity, but with the moon as close to the Earth as it can get. And when the Moon is at its closest distance to the Earth, it's at its maximum orbital velocity, so that figure's not quite right. That's why I only gave it a four significant figures. Right, that is 1.7 hours. He said seven minutes. This is 14.7 times seven minutes. Kyle was wrong. Or he was lying. Or he was wrong and lying. Because it's entirely possible he's not just dishonest or a moron, but actually a dishonest moron. But wait, there's more. Well, there is that little detail about 1,018 miles per minute that they're going around the sun. What that means is that the direction of the Earth's shadow out into space is rotating at a, 
enormous, just, just very slightly less than one degree per day. This is the difference between the 86164.1 second sidereal day and the 86400 second solar day, mean solar day. Obviously, the solar day varies in length because the Earth's orbital, the Earth Moon system's orbital velocity around the Sun varies because the, uh, that orbit is not perfectly circular. But what that means is that you get very slightly more time. You take that figure and multiply it by 86,400 divided by 86,164.1 to find out how much extra time you get. It's not much different. But anyway. That's the full umbra. He did specify it's a shadow that's converging, right? Of course I googled the longest lunar eclipse. You don't think I was going to take his word for it, do you? Six hour long. More than four hours. That's that much was true. For Kyle, that's a rarity, you know? There were at least two things that were approximately true in that statement. The longest lunar eclipse to occur within a span of a thousand years. Aligns with the full moon tonight and into the early morning hours tomorrow. 18th November 2021, smithsonianmagazine.com. But read carefully. A six hour long partial lunar eclipse. Not a total lunar eclipse. The umbra would give you a total lunar eclipse. A partial lunar eclipse is the penumbra, which is the one that gets wider and wider the farther beyond the Earth you go but also kind of thinner and thinner in the sense that more and more of the sun becomes visible. When you need a solar filter to see the Earth as this tiny little speck in silhouette against the sun, it's not really dimming your day much. This flips a whole lot of things around. Now, the more tapered the shadow, the wider it's going to be because it's tapering outwards, not inwards. So we flip the numbers for... Um, and the farther out the moon is, the wider, th rather than the closer, the wider. So we did the same calculations, but we now have uh, perigee and aphelion, or apogee and perihelion, the other way around. And instead of subtracting the Earth's radius from the sun's radius, we are adding them to get how far the light from northernmost part of the visible side of the sun goes to southernmost part of the sunlit side of the earth it's a greater distance and instead of subtracting that from the earth's radius we add it to the earth's radius to see how much farther it goes because it's already gone beyond the equatorial plane it's getting farther from it which is why we get numbers like 16,000 and some kilometers at the end there. So now we have a 16,000, well, a maximum value of 16,627 kilometers. And a partial eclipse isn't the moon being fully in the penumbra, it's any part of the moon being in the penumbra. So we don't subtract the moon's diameter from that, we add it. Add the moon's diameter to that maximum width, and we get over 20,000 seconds. 5.757 hours. That's, that's six hours long to one significant figure. And it's most of 50 times the seven minutes figure that Kyle gave. Meaning Kyle was, uh, let's see, um, I think the English phrase for it is talking.